Well, okay, are you ready? Uh, let's get ready to welcome Dr. David Peck. He's been on our program before, and we bring him back again. So, hello, David. Hello, David. How's How it going? You? Oh, listen. <laughs> it's, either, it's either hailstones falling on the roof or <laughs> some canned applause. <laughs> well, it's good to see you again, David, and uh, thanks for joining us for the live stream again. I like your um, observation hive. Looks like they're back there moving. Yeah, there's, could there's, be just pictures, I guess. There's no better backdrop than than real bees. So I, I always like to bring these girls in in the fall and then try to try to get them through to the spring and then hope that they don't swarm on me before I get them out into a real hive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's good. Well, yeah, that's great. So uh, I know you, uh, you've probably been like me. You've been busy doing a whole bunch of bee stuff and speaking and all that good thing. So thanks for taking time out of your schedule to be with us tonight. My audience, David, as you might remember, they are sharp cookies. They <laughs> really know their stuff. Absolutely. Uh, but they want to know more. So I thought, man, I got to bring somebody very, very smart in here to take us to the <laughs> next level. And that's well, you. I don't know if I'm smart, but I, I do feel like I have some knowledge because I, I spend a lot of time, you know, worming my way around in here and asking what I think are the right questions. So I, I tend to, to have some insights into what's going on or what might happen next. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm always happy to share that with folks like you and your audience. Okay, great. Well, super. So what we're going to do tonight, David, do a little talking about uh, mic control and uh, what treatments to use. And then we're going to you know, of course, allow and have an opportunity for our audience to ask their questions. And uh, so that'd be a big help tonight. So one of the things that I want to jump right in with uh, before we get into uh, uh, a lot of the uh, question time is there are some new types of treatments that are out there. And I don't even know how to pronounce them. Um, maybe you can help <laughs> us out. Um, but one of them is Amiflex, and I believe yep. that's I believe that's Amitrez, right? That's right. It's okay. it's made by the same company that makes Apivar, yeah. and it is, both of them are Amitraz based. So Amitraz is the active ingredient in the pesticide, but then these are the two different products that are are now registered in the U.S. for them to sell. So Amiflex. the Apivar strips we're all used to. Amiflex yep. is a a gel that you can it basically dispense like uh, like you would caulk out of a caulk gun. And, and squirt that onto a card, put those cards into your hives, and then you've got a, a very rapid release of Amitraz to knock your mite population down. Hmm. You know, at some of my readings, I saw that it was targeted toward commercial beekeepers. Is that right? It is. And it, it's not just targeted towards them. It's, it's almost impossible for you to get if you aren't a commercial beekeeper, ah. because the way it was registered in the U.S. is that it was registered as a restricted use pesticide or an RUP. And the nice thing about that for the company is that they don't have to jump through quite as many hoops in order to get it approved. The downside is you can only sell it if you are licensed to sell restricted use pesticides and you mm. can only buy it and use it if you're a licensed pesticide pesticide applicator. So if you are, um, you know, if you uh, want to buy it from me and you live in, in Ohio and I'm here in New York, then I have to get a New York license so that I can sell it. You have to get uh, an Ohio license and then send me a copy of it so that I can have it on file so I can ship it to you in, in Ohio. So oh, it, it winds up being a, a real headache um, for, for folks who just want to get a little bit of it to play around with in the backyard oh. apiary. But for a big commercial beekeeper, it can be useful, although, of course, a lot of them are moving their bees from state to state to state to state, and yeah. they need to be licensed in each of those states in order wow. to do it. So it uh, is, and, and is you Amif know, got Amif some Amif Yeah, Amiflex, is, is it a flash treatment, too? It is, yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a rapid introduction of a, a bunch of amitraz into the colony. It's actually, in some ways, less amitraz going into the colony than there would be in one apivar strip. But it's it's there. It's sort of all getting released from the gel very quickly oh, all at once, and yeah. then getting circulated through the colony. And then you would do multiple applications if you wanted to to sort of knock the mites down multiple times. Yeah, in the old old days, uh, a friend told me that mm -hmm. they used to put amitraz in grease patties. Yep, in, in the commercial yards. Is is this product similar to that? They're kind of putting amitraz in in a support 
an agent to carry it like that? Yeah, essentially, yes. And I, I know that there are, you know, there are there are commercial beekeepers who don't follow the pesticide laws and are doing all sorts of no. stuff with, with <laughs> miticides. But, um, you know, part of how part of how products like this get developed is, you know, these commercial beekeepers will will bring in the reps from the, the legal pesticide companies and say, hey, do you want to see what we're mixing up in the barn? And they'll go in and they'll take notes on it. And then oh, wow. that might that might become the recipe for the formula that gets released I a see. little further okay, down gotcha. the line. Interesting. So it's not not to endorse that kind of behavior. It really no, does harm the industry. But right. it it yeah. uh you know you've got you've got folks who are um playing around and and sometimes we wind up with with folks clamoring for a flash emetraz treatment because they've yeah. talked to a friend who said that it worked pretty well for them and they'd like to have one legally available. Okay. So in other words, this may not be something that the common backyard beekeeper needs to get too excited about? I don't think so. I, you know, okay. the, I, I've talked to the company and they are looking at that restricted use pesticide uh, approval that they got and they're l sort of rethinking it. They're looking at whether they can get it approved as just a regular old miticide that you can buy like anything else. And if that happens, if they're able to get that through and the EPA approves those changes, then it might become something that, that any of us could get access to. Okay. Um, but it's not really in the hands of beekeepers just quite yet, unless you're a certain kind of beekeeper who can jump through some hoops. Okay. How about, uh, you know, in the news, yep. blue, green or green, blue algae, edible algae. Yeah. What's so the there deal was with this, that? There was this great paper that just came out. It, it came out of um, the Resigliano lab at the Baton Rouge B lab uh, that the USDA runs. And, the, you know, there's, there's no greater friend to beekeepers than the USDA Agricultural Research Service, because they have got these permanently funded honeybee labs where they hire qualified honeybee scientists and they basically just let them run amok uh, you know they're able to do all sorts of exciting cool work to help beekeepers like us and so this work is is um, built on this foundation of the fact that if you look at blue green algae which isn't really an algae it's actually it's a it's a species called cyanobacteria but the the cyanobacteria are commonly called blue green algae and it's stuff that grows in water so for you know for laymen like us it's pretty close to an algae um if you take that stuff and you you grow it in a lab and then you feed it to bees it actually is very very similar to pollen it has a lot of the same nutritional profile. Bees can digest it. They don't. They aren't. Don't suffer any harm from eating it. So it's a it's a useful feed that can be grown in a lab or grown in a big bioreactor and fed to bees. What's cool about it, though, is that you can also genetically engineer it. And so this paper that came out was their lab basically taking the this blue green algae that we know the bees will eat like a protein substitute, and they engineered it to produce these little strands of DNA. And when the DNA gets into the bees, it actually uh, it gets into their cells and then the DNA starts you know, making little you know, subsequent molecules, these RNA molecules, which are the product of DNA floating around in the cell. Well, the RNA molecules go and they float around in the cell. And if they bump into any of the genetic material from deformed wing virus, they will actually bind with it and interfere with it. And they prevent the deformed wing virus from replicating itself. Mm. So essentially what this is, is a way to feed bees this genetically engineered algae. The algae gets into their guts. These, these little DNA particles float around and then they get the bee's body to become more or less immune or at least resistant to deformed wing virus. Deformed wing virus is trying to go in and hijack the bee's cells. And the cells are there saying, no, 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 we know your tricks. We're not going to have any of that. So it's a really cool technology that they've developed. And it's, it's, it's really neat that it's built on this foundation of, hey, this, this particular species of blue-green algae that could be grown on a big commercial scale is a pretty darn good protein substitute for bees. But on top of that, we can actually engineer this stuff to contain all sorts of these little DNA snippets that will go in and do particular things that we'd like it to do in the cell. So this is a paper that they published saying that they were able to feed this stuff to bees, inject those bees with deformed wing virus, and extend their lifespan and, and decrease the likelihood of them getting any wing deformities, which is pretty amazing. But they're also working on all sorts of other bee viruses. They're working on ways that they can fight Varroa using the same technology. And so it's got a lot of potential. But once again, 
it's nothing that the backyard beekeeper can go to the store and buy this year. And I, you know, it's a really cool paper. I read that paper and I thought, oh, this will be great. I'll write a, a newsletter article for the monthly Better Bee newsletter so folks can learn about it. And then I did a little more research and reading and I found all sorts of beekeeper forums where people were saying, oh, this is great. I'm going to go out and scoop up some of my green pond water and put it into my feeders because there's plenty of algae there. And now my bees are going to be resistant to viruses. So, you know, that that's not the way this thing works. <laughs> it's, it's really important that we're clear when we do this high tech, cool science. It's got a lot of potential for us, but we can't just read that paper or skim that paper or read the title of that paper and then run out and grab some some, you know, pond scum and throw it into our hives and hope that it's going to keep our bees healthy. I, I saw some on Amazon. You can buy blue green algae on Amazon. The power. Right. And but I, you can't I just you can't get blue green my... algae that has been, uh, you know, genetically engineered by the USDA oh. Baton Rouge lab to fight deformed wing. OK, I'm glad we yet. clarified that. You can't get that yet. But there could very well come a day where, where they're able to roll that out into a product. And the beauty of it being developed by the USDA is that they're not out there trying to make a buck on it, that they're going to roll this out as a product that beekeepers can get access to at, at likely a very affordable rate that, that is created so that it could help us, not so that it can cause trouble. Okay. I have mixed feelings coming out through the chat. Some people are saying, I love that kind of science. Others are saying, I don't want anything genetically engineered. Yep. Well, you, what's, the, what's are, the downside of genetic engineering? Well, there's plenty of downsides of genetic engineering and there's plenty of upsides. You know, it's a very, very powerful tool and it's a tool that we're just figuring out how to use. Um, so, you know, if, if you think about primitive humans, you know, the only tool we had for a long time was a rock. And then suddenly somebody discovered fire and there's a lot of good stuff you can do with fire and there's a lot of dangerous stuff you can do with fire. And we are at the stage right now where we've burned down a couple of huts and we've, you know, uh, we've cooked a couple of steaks and we're trying to figure out where and when exactly we want to use this, this toolkit yeah. that we've now suddenly got available. Yeah. Um, so if you aren't interested in genetically engineered algae being fed to your bees, then by all means, you should be learning more about other kinds of mitocides. There are right. other ways to control varroa mites that don't require this stuff, yeah. um, but it is exciting. It's promising, and it, the the safety is being worked out very carefully. It's not some company rushing it to market. It's the federal government. They're not going to release something until they're very sure that it's it's you know safe. Yeah. Okay. Well, now, David, in 2024, um, what do you think is going to be or still is uh, one of the best handful of approaches that beekeepers can take to control their mites? Well, I, I'm glad you asked best handful of pro approaches and not best miticide, because yeah. I, the, the idea that there's a best miticide, I think, is the, the biggest failure of beekeepers. It's what leads us to the most trouble. Because if I told you that I think that Formic Pro is a great miticide, then you'd say, oh, David said Formic Pro is good. I'm going to use it even though it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit out and you're going to cook your bees. Um, if I said that I think that, you know, uh, Apolife VAR or, or Apigard, these thymol-based treatments are really valuable tools for us to keep our mites down at certain times of year, you might put it onto your, your hives, even if you've got supers on, and now you're going to have thyme-flavored honey, which nobody wants to buy from you, and, and uh, which isn't legal to sell. Yeah. So, you know, the mindset, I think, is the most important thing of, of understanding you have varroa mites. Every single one of us has varroa mites. And if we miraculously killed all of the varroa mites in one of our hives, we would get more varroa mites from somebody else's bees or from some swarm out in the trees. So the varroa mites are there. The population, hopefully, going into the spring is relatively low. And we want to knock it down as low as we can get it. And then over the course of the year, certainly through the periods that we're making honey that we intend to harvest, we want to do whatever we can to keep those mite levels low. And so there's a lot of different tools available for that. And which tool is the right tool is, is always going to be up in the air. Um, yeah. And then, you know, when we get our honey harvested later on in the year, then that's the point where you might want to go with a, a heavier hitter and try to knock those mite levels way, way down, getting ready for winter. But you can't view Varroa as a once a year, pull my supers off in August or, or September and then do a treatment problem. It just doesn't work that way. We've, we've got to hit them harder and more frequently. Okay, um, yeah. So there's a lot of tools, but but I wouldn't say that there's any there's any one that I would point to so much as that mindset of I will use multiple tools. I will have to do multiple things to control mites this year. But yeah. no one thing is very hard. You just step in, take a little bit of action this month, take a little bit of action next month, and your mites aren't going to be a major problem. 
How about this? Uh, Art says, are there parts of the country that might, uh, problems are better or worse? Yeah. So wh what we often hear is that the further south you go in the United States, the less people are talking about varroa mite problems and the more they're talking about something like small hive beetles as, as a major challenge for their beekeeping. And that's true. If you go somewhere like Florida that's nearly tropical, small hive beetles are, can be a catastrophe for a colony very, very quickly. Up here where we've got the ground freezing solid for months out of the year, I have small hive beetles. I see you know a couple of them every year, but it's usually just a couple of them. It's, it's really not a major problem. My bees can keep it under control. Um, in the same way, Varroa it seems to be less of a problem in the South. It's not that people don't have Varroa populations and it's not that they don't have to treat, but I think it's that when your bees have to get through a winter that's only three weeks long and then it turns into spring again, they aren't facing a really severe, you know, non-biological weather-related challenge that that being really weakened by varroa mites makes them less able to overcome. Up here in the north where we might have a, a winter that, that starts early and ends late and, and could stretch for five months, um, it's entirely possible that a colony that's only very slightly weakened by mites and viruses just won't be able to, to cut the mustard and get through until the spring. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that there's that, that very slight uh, tendency that that mites are less of an issue in the south and more in the north but but no there's there's nowhere that's safe from varroa and there's nowhere where you can just ignore varroa mites yeah wow that's good to know um so what about these uh, i've heard things about you know the mushrooms uh mushroom spores oh yeah like yep. Uh, yep. Any, any were any progress being made with that i get that asked a lot too yeah, so there's, there are a few different labs that are trying to tackle that. Some of them at the USDA. I know that there are some researchers at the USDA uh, lab in Beltsville that are also uh, looking at some of these um, some of these funguses that might potentially be able to kill mites but not harm bees in any way. There are other folks who have been talking about mushroom extracts or mushroom teas or some you know mushroom uh, you know distilled mushroom substance that you can put in to feed that might boost bee health in some ways. Um, I haven't seen any good evidence that that the the mushroom extracts are are yet proving uh, as valuable as people might might want them to be. I have talked to the scientists doing some of the research on funguses that actually directly kill varroa mites, and again, none of them have anything ready to come to market. But they're all working hard and they're working diligently, and they are making you know they're making progress. They're figuring out what doesn't work. That's always easier in science than figuring out what does. It's pretty easy to figure out something that kills all the bees. Uh, it's pretty easy <laughs> yeah. to find something that doesn't kill all the mites. The question is, are they getting closer to strains or or selection criteria or management strategies that that get the result they want? And okay. you know, nobody said, here's the graph. <laughs> you know, David, don't tell anyone. It's going to be released next month. Like, there's nothing in the wings that's that's quite that um, ready to go. But there there are good scientists doing good work on this front. So if there's something to be discovered, we're going to find it. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, sometimes I'll get questions from people and they'll say, Hey, David, I, a friend of mine's a beekeeper down the road. He's got like 50 hives and he mixes up garlic and stirs it in with sugar. And when the moon is full facing South and yep. puts twigs of basil in there and shakes it up and grinds it and then dehydrates and puts it on i'm making all this up but there's right. there's concoctions that people mm -hmm. will hear or watch somebody say on youtube and oh my gosh they can't get that mixture fast enough because one guy right. one right. guy said you know without any empirical data or anything just said oh my gosh this works great and right. you know I, what i, I how, think we've how I do you deal with a, that yeah, I think we've got a bit of a problem as beekeepers or as a as a community of beekeepers where, we, you know, we know that when we go to buy a used car from a used car salesman that we're going to get a used car salesman's <laughs> and, and that we can't quite trust it. Right. You, he, we can't trust every single word he says is gospel. And, you know, I think the same is true of some YouTubers and obviously not all YouTubers. Um, there are folks who are out here trying to do good bee education and teach people about bees and beekeeping and sharing our own insights and our own experiences. Um, and then there's other folks who are either out to make a buck or they're just out to get attention. They want to get a lot of clicks and a lot of views, and they don't care whether their information is accurate. There are some folks who seem like they don't really understand 
what they are or aren't doing that is or isn't killing the mites. You know, you'll hear folks who have uh, this recipe and that recipe and this thing and that thing. And then you also take an, an apivar strip and you throw it in. And we say, well, all right, I think the apivar <laughs> strip is doing the heavy lifting yeah. and your magical tea is just making you feel good. Um, I think there's other folks who are, who are um, being less honest about it. It's not that they don't understand it. It's that they don't particularly care about being accurate. And I think it's important that, that the folks out here who are trying to do good beekeeping education are, are you know, working together, uh, and, you know, having this community of folks who we know, we, we trust each other, and we feel like what you know, I say on your channel or you might say on my channel would be trustworthy because, because we're doing our homework. Um, and we're not we're not out here trying to make a buck just by by having something salacious or exciting or dramatic yeah. or or whatever. You know, I, there's a lot of different legal miticides that you can use to kill varroa mites. And if if you haven't mastered the use of each of those in your hives, I don't know why you would want to go out and mix up some garlic and rhubarb and and you know uh, uh, grass clippings or, or whatever it is your your buddy told you to do. Yeah. Um, so I would say you should you will profit more as a beekeeper by mastering the legal stuff and then paying attention when when trustworthy sources are talking about the the cutting edge of where we might be in two or three years mm -hmm. um you know some guy on youtube probably isn't the most trustworthy source for anything least of all keeping your bees alive <laughs> <laughs> okay well uh, yeah, that's always going to be the case. Uh, I, I like your analogy of the used car salesman. You've got to know the source. You got to yeah. you got to look at the credentials and be skeptical. There, you know, there are times, David, that I do things with my hives, and and I I'm not doing you know 30 hives this way and 30 controlled and 30 the other way, mm -hmm. but I'm just doing this, and voila! I, wow, that worked out really good. But I always like to say. Now, this is me just doing it in my backyard. This is That's just it. a single backyard anecdotal little equation here. I have this many hives. I was also doing this. We had a particularly, you know, dry yeah. summer or warm winter. Sure. And, and, and I live in this location. And, and all of those things are going to matter. When, uh, when Varroa scientists like myself try to demonstrate that something is effective, it's not just me sitting out here with 10 hives, no matter how good my statistics are. It's I'm doing this test, but I've got Megan Milbrath at, at, you know, out in Michigan. I've got Lewis Bartlett at the University of Georgia. I've got Cameron Jack at the University of Florida. We've got the Auburn Bee Lab. We've got the Cornell Bee Labs. We've got all of these different labs. And when we want to say, hey, this is something that we believe works, generally it's because we've all tried it. We've all tested it. And we've all generated data. And we look at it together and we say, yeah, this is scientific validated okay so what if somebody doesn't want to get into chemical treatments but they do want to do something about mites yep but they don't want to douse their you know uh hive with these things even though they're proven to be you know not absorbed in the honey and all that and right still right. there's just something about them that they want to be able to say i want to right. keep my mite levels under control without the chemicals what do you right. recommend in that scenario? Well, the I'll you know I'm an I'm an obnoxious scientist, and so I'll I'll always point out that water is a chemical too, and so that this sort of imaginary line we draw where we say we're not adding any chemicals to our hive, maybe we need to be a little bit more flexible about. It. So the idea of of drawing a line and saying I don't want to use any synthetic miticides, I don't want to use you know apistan strips or apivar strips, but I will use some of these thymol treatments or I will use one of the organic acids, you know something like formic acid, which is naturally found in honey and it's naturally found in bee venom, so it's a molecule that it makes sense to have in the hive. Um, we're putting it in at a higher level, obviously, but it's something that these bodies are sort of used to. I, I think we need to allow ourselves some room to to say, well, I tried to do this, I tried to do that, the mite level still got too high, so maybe I'll reach for for sort of the first chemical on my list of, of things that I I'd like to try, and not go all the way to the you know the synthetic pesticide at the end of the lab that list. But yeah. if you want to keep your mites under control and you don't want to add any of these miticide uh, treatments in, there are strategies that you can use. And one of the most powerful of them is creating a brood break. We know that varroa mites reproduce in the brood and then they ride around on the bees and then they go into the brood and reproduce again and they ride around on the bees and they go through a few of those cycles in their lifespan. 
So going from spring until fall, you know, the beginning of winter, the mites are just going through that cycle over and over and over again. So if you want a really big productive honey production colony that always has a queen laying lots and lots of eggs, then you're always going to have brood, which means that those mites will always have a new place to, to increase their numbers in. If you create a brood break, if you split your colony and you, you create this period of, excuse me, this period of time where nobody's laying any eggs in, in at least half of that split, then you've created a brood break. If you split your colony in a sort of a care, careful, deliberate way, and you put all of the capped brood in one side and all of the uncapped brood in another side, well, now you've got no capped brood, which is which is still means that there's nowhere for the varroa to hide. Um, that's the point where a lot of beekeepers would say, all right, I've done this non-chemical treatment, but now I'm going to hit them with the oxalic acid vapor, or now I'm going to hit them with the, the hop guard or something like that. Um, but even if you don't want to do that, you can, you can do these splits, and then you can put in your drone comb frame. And we can trap the mites by having them all be particularly attracted to drone comb, go in there, once those cells get capped, you pop it into your freezer, and now I've re mechanically just removed a whole bunch of my varroa mites along with that drone brood. Um, and then my colony has gone through a brood break. The, the only brood available for a while was the drone brood, and the mites all got basically vacuumed up into it. So I have killed a lot of my varroa mites doing that. It's a much more fiddly method, and it's a method that will, that will end in you not necessarily making, you know, I will say you won't make any honey. I'll say that you're going to make less honey using that technique. Mm -hmm. um, but there is more and more beekeepers who are trying techniques like that. Uh, and one of the things that we've got, where do I have a, uh, here. Um, one of the, the cool tools that I'm really excited about for using that are these uh, frame isolation cages, these cages that are, are basically queen excluder material that go around them. So I can open this up and I can put one frame in or there's a there's a two frame width version as well. I can cage my queen up in there and then instead of instead of, you know, sp having her spend July trapped in a little three hole cage. Um, where, where she can't lay any eggs, she's able to lay the eggs, but only in a couple of frames. I can control where there is brood and isn't brood very carefully with this. Mm -hmm. And so that's basically going to serve as that, that vacuum for varroa mites. Over time, the only place for them to go is going to be into those couple of frames. And I can pop them out into the freezer and then let the queen out, let her start laying eggs everywhere else, filling up the colony again, regrowing to get ready for the fall flow. And it's, a, it's an intervention that works if you really understand the bee biology and the mite biology. Yeah, right. So yeah. That's, I think that's sort of my main takeaway is that if you yeah. come to me and say, I, I want to be a treatment-free beekeeper, I'll say, okay, fine. If you don't want to add chemicals, that's okay. But you can't be a, non, uh, you know, a, a beekeeper that doesn't manage your varroa mites at all. Right. Yeah. And so you've got to take some steps. And in order to do that well, you can't kind of understand what varroa are all about. You've got to yeah. really master varroa biology to be able to go in and hit them right where it hurts if you aren't using the chemicals. I oftentimes have heard people say, not so much anymore, but back 10 years ago, it was hard. Mm -hmm. It seemed like it was difficult for, for me to try to help new beginners understand that mites are a problem and you need to do yeah. something. But it's getting better now. But back then I do remember hearing, and I hear it some today is, I don't have mites. I can't, I, I've looked, I don't see them. And <laughs> I've always thought, okay, you've either got really bad eyesight. <laughs> yep. You know, there's something else going on there. Uh, you have them. And people will occasionally argue with me and say, no, I'm serious. I, I've, I've done mite tests. I'm coming back zero. I don't have mites at all. And I just simply say, well, you know, um, you're a fortunate person. But I think we're pretty safe to say that almost every hive is going to have mites. Yeah. What what we often get, because better be, we make overwintered nukes every year and then sell them in the spring and we, we sell people packages of bees. So we have people contact us and they say, now, do you guarantee that there are no varroa mites in my package or in my nuke? And I say, not only do I not guarantee that, I guarantee that I'm giving you at least one varroa mite. And I guarantee <laughs> that she's going to have daughters and that her yeah. daughters are going to have daughters and that you're yeah. going to have to manage them. Well, um, I, uh, I would it, never it, dream of saying that, uh, that you're not going to get a varroa mite. Well, here's the deal, though. Even if you buy a, a nuke or a package that is completely clean of the varroa right. destructor mite, my gosh, it's not going to take long at all until one makes it in there, right? On the back of one of your foragers or something. Or Robert will, B. 
Bees will all... drift miles. They'll rob over the course of miles. Yeah. If you got a sickly little piddly colony out in, in your neighbor's yep. barn and you get your brand new pristine bees in there, they're going to find the honey. They're going to go steal it. And if there's any living varroa mites in there, they're going to hitch a ride home. And, and now you've got mites back in the colony. And they're going to reproduce so mm-hmm. fast that That's people it. just don't realize, you know, they're coming in the front door and they're reproducing in your hive. Same with small hive beetle. I mean, yeah. they can reproduce so quickly. Maybe you don't yeah. have any in your in your new package or your nuke, but oh my gosh, one mama beetle makes it in there and holy cow, they can explode so fast. Right, right. Well, and the scariest thing about the beetles too is that small hive beetles can fly for miles and they have very sensitive antennae. They can smell a colony that is getting killed by small hive beetles. So if you get one mama beetle in and nobody's there to stop her babies from reproducing, that's going to be attracting all the other mama beetles in the area and all the males, they'll all come in and mate. And so you can have a colony be rapidly overwhelmed by, um, by, those, uh, by the small hive beetles just because they're, they're rolling in as they smell the problem getting worse and worse. Luckily, yeah. varroa mites don't seem to do that. You know, they're just trying to get into colonies. And if there's a, a, a colony that they're in and a bee from somewhere else shows up, they might jump onto her and ride her home. But um, we, we luckily don't have varroa mites sitting around and, and plotting which hive they're going to go leap into next. Yeah. I want to get back to your, uh, I, I use those, uh, those queen excluder frames that you oh, showed yeah. just a minute ago. And one of the things that, um, I, I, maybe you can hold it up and look, but at the top where you put the metal plate on, yep. it almost seems like on mine. And I think I did get them from better B. It seemed like there was a gap on the edge that the queen could. Yeah. Yeah. So, like so that. the lid pops up like this and, and when you put it on, you're right, there is a gap there. So now let's, let's see a real test of my office is, do I have a frame kicking around? Yes. Here's <laughs> I <laughs> well, I too. Barely yeah. had to stand up. There we are. <laughs> All right. So when I put this frame in here, you know, the the reason that this this isn't perfectly molded around the edge of the frame is that I don't want to sell you a cage and then tell you you can only buy better be frames to use it. So okay. if you're getting your frames from Data Ant or Man Lake or some, you know, local Mennonite craftsman or, or from me, then they're all going to fit into here. But you're right that there is this gap. Yeah. Now, if I put this thing into a box, the sides of that box, the, the rabbits of that box are generally going to cover that. So I'm, for the most part, not going to have any risk of the queen getting out. I have met people who have boxes that have slightly funny shapes. Yeah. And they have said, well, I can see daylight through there, and that makes me nervous. So I'm going to get a little piece of foam rubber and just yeah. glue it right here on the edge, and that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, I, but I, you know, I have used they... these myself and not had that problem. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, it's, the queen does kind of sometimes get... Um, more adventurous and yeah. kind of try to get out of stuff. But, you know, mostly she's in the middle. I've never know. seen the queen on the ears of my frames like that. No, right. Not, you know, I you agree. never see yeah. her up there. That's not where she's going. Her job is to walk around on comb. Yeah. So right, even well, if good. she could theoretically get out, yeah. I've not seen it happen. I think for me, I put some gorilla tape on there just to make me sleep better at night. You know, yeah. <laughs> I probably wasn't needed, but it's like, oh, I'm just going to cover that little hole up. <laughs> A lot of my beekeeping doesn't, doesn't need to be done, but it makes me more comfortable. Oh yeah. Beekeeping. I, so I, I totally it. agree. Yeah. 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 All right, let's let's uh, let's let um, Sherry and Jessica fire any questions that you might want to throw up. Uh, what is that? Uh, this is Philip. Uh, this is great information. Oh, David yeah. Peck does a great job relaying the latest news. Thanks for hosting. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Well, our privilege to have David with us tonight. Uh, does Apovar build up on Hive equipment? So you've got to be very precise in the question. So Apivar is a plastic strip that has amitraz in it. That's the active ingredient. Mm-hmm. Amitraz is a pesticide that breaks down relatively quickly. The amitraz molecule, you know, that you put into your hive that kills the varroa mites, that's going to break up, but it doesn't break up into fairy dust. It breaks up into other smaller molecules. There is basically no amitraz residue in any parts of your hive equipment, any parts of your honey. There is detectable amitraz breakdown product residues that can get into some of those um, materials. And with a very high powered laboratory setup, you can find little traces of it all over the place. Um, The advantage of of the amitraz is that it breaks down very quickly. It breaks down into stuff that that we don't believe is is as harmful or as risky for us or the bees or the mites to be exposed to. Um, So it it becomes more inert as it's breaking down. Um, And it's also not going to saturate the 
the wax. And so it's not going to build up this long standing residue that the mites are going to be slowly exposed to and then build up resistance for. Mm. So um, the, the, the Apivar product has these breakdown products, which can be detected, but you're not going to have a major buildup of, of amitraz residues inside your hive, or even a major residue uh, buildup of those yeah. breakdown products, unless you put it on while you've got your honey supers on. There is a risk of it getting into the honey, and that's why you cannot use it with supers on, and you can't put your supers on until all of these breakdown products have had times to sort of you know evaporate or, or get uh, broken down and distributed across the hive. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. All right. Got another question for Dr. David tonight about controlling your mites. Is it best to change treatment types throughout the year? For example, HopGuard 3 in the spring, OA in the summer, AppGuard in the fall? So as an evolutionary biologist, I'm, I'm going to tell you that if we only ever use one active ingredient, what we are doing is we are selecting for the varroa mites that are resistant to that thing, right? When yeah. you, when you, if you, if you watch the uh, commercial and they say, you know, this kills 99.9% .9 of germs, the very good question is what about the 0.1%? What, what's up with them? Why didn't they get killed? And if you keep using the same thing and those, you know, those 0.1% survived because they've got some mutant gene that makes them a little bit tougher, or a little bit better able to deal with it, then you can get yourself in trouble. And we, we saw that with Apistan. We saw that with um, uh, Kumafos based treatment, Checkmite. And we have seen that and we are seeing it with Amitraz. We know for a fact that there are more Apivar, Amitraz, Amiflex, you know, illegal Amitraz resistant mites than there used to be. And if we keep abusing that tool, then there are going to be more and more and more of those. We also know that if you take an apiary that's full of amitraz resistant mites and you stop using amitraz for a full year and you treat them with just oxalic acid or just some other active ingredient, and then you go back to the apiary and you start t testing them and figuring out if they're amitraz resistant or not, they aren't. They basically lose it. It goes away pretty quickly. So rotating between these different miticides is a really healthy habit for us to get into. Now, that's not yeah. to say that I wouldn't use formic acid in June and then go in in August and go, geez, my mite levels are high. And you know what? I think formic is still the right choice for me to use again. Yeah. But we don't want to get into a rut of just using the same thing over and over again. Yeah. How long do we wait to put the supers on after removing the Apivar strips? Oh, uh, yeah, don't, I, I, I won't give you a number because I don't want you to quote me on it. And I, I'm, I'm yeah. not confident that I remember offhand. It's a period of, I, I think, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, and so you need to, when you're scheduling <clears throat> your Amitraz treatment, your Apivar treatment, you need to figure out, all right, how long is this treatment going to be in the hive? And then how long after I remove those strips? does it still is it still not safe to put supers on before you know before i move into my honey production season so mm. i have people calling me now and saying david it's the end of march should i put an apivar strip in and i talk about their latitude and i figure out when their maple trees and their dandelions will start blooming and i say unfortunately you've actually run out of time at this time of year it's just too late already for you to put it in go through the treatment get it out and then put your supers on yeah that's right um and the risk is that if you if you take it off and you're not putting your supers on you're not putting your supers on and the honey flow starts now you've got your bees that you're steering towards swarming and you don't want your bees to swarm first thing in the year you want to you know have them growing and and you know yeah. if you split them you want to do it on your terms not on their terms yeah that's really good i like that yeah do you think it's okay if i use comb that was in the hive during an Apigard treatment last year for use in a honey super this year. Uh, yes, it's, that's fine. And it's a, um, it's perfectly legal to do that. It's perfectly fine to do that. I have met honey judges that will tell you that they can taste if somebody used um, Apigard or Apolife Var, these two thymol based treatments. Um, they'll say that they can taste that if, if they used it and then that got used as a super the next year, they'll go, oh, I can still taste those residues. <laughs> I can still taste that flavor. Taste it minty is, fresh, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And like, you know, thymol is is the essential or part of the essential oil of the herb thyme. So mm. if I make a chicken and corn soup using my mom's recipe, I'm I'm eating more thymol then than I am <laughs> if I get a little bit of residue in my honey. 
so uh, it's not gonna of, yeah. it's not gonna kill you to have those little residuals but it's not something that's gonna make your honey more valuable yeah. Yeah. so it's something to be mindful of sniff the comb if the comb doesn't smell like time all i wouldn't be that worried if you're yeah. if your comb reeks of time all maybe that's a brood comb not a not a honey super yeah hey uh is it true that propolis causes veromite to be infertile oh so there's a lot of really cool research that has been done on propolis, and it's important to remember what propolis is. It, it is collected plant resins that the bees have gone out and foraged for. And so in the same way that, you know, if you have your bees in a basswood grove and I have my bees in a, an orange grove, we're going to make different honey because we've got different nectar going into it. Your bees are going to be collecting different resins than my bees. So to talk about propolis as just one thing is is always going to be a little bit misleading. There is some research that has shown that some of the compounds in some propolis samples do have negative effects on varroa mites and that bees seem to fare better. They seem to have lower virus levels. A lot of this work has been done by uh, Marla Spivak and, and her students and folks that have worked with her over the years. So there's really cool work that that suggests that propolis has value to a hive. Um, but, you know, I can't say for sure that if you have propolis in your hive, you won't have any varroa mites, or if you have propolis in your hive, you won't have virus problems. It's it's important to recognize this is something that bees collect in nature, and they've been doing it for millions of years. And if they've been doing it for millions of years, and for the last 200 years, we've decided it's annoying and we're going to breed it out of them, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's possible that we're being a little arrogant and we might be making a mistake. Yeah. There could be some value that we haven't discovered yet. And it seems like to me the most valuable part of the propolis propolis in the hive is that it reduces the amount of, let's say, energy that the bees have to use on their own ability to fight off pathogens because some of the propolis on the walls of the hive sure. is helping right. them. Right. If, if it has those antimicrobial properties, then it's it's basically, you know, like building yourself a, uh, uh, soaking your bed sheets in antibiotics. You know, yeah. It's, yeah. it's not something that I'd recommend for, you know, human health control, but it might produce reduce the risk of infections if you had yeah. something in your environment that was just yeah, helping right. to fight some of those microbes. Yeah. Can you use uh, OAV all year long in spring, summer, and fall? You can, yeah. So uh, oxalic acid, the legal oxalic acids, and there's two legal oxalic acid uh, vaporized, va two legal oxalic acid sources that you can vaporize in your hives. That is uh, apibioxal, and easy ox those are the two legal registered oxalic acid powders or an easy ox has tablets as well um that oxalic acid vapor can be used when you've got honey supers on when you don't have honey supers on spring summer or fall or even during the winter um so you can do that and it will kill varroa mites every time you do it every time you put oxalic acid vapor into the hive you're going to kill at least one varroa mite but <laughs> yeah. you know are you going to kill 95 percent of your mites or are you going to kill 40% of your mites. Yeah. 40% ain't bad, but it ain't that good. So it's not something that I would generally steer someone towards for a midsummer treatment when they've got lots and lots of brood, because we know that something else might be more effective at, at that time. Um, but yeah, there's, there's nothing pr that prevents you from doing it. I know people who use oxalic acid vapor repeatedly throughout the year and, and are happy with the results. The real question is, you know, find somebody who's doing whatever you're proposing to do in your bees this year and ask them what their mite levels were. You know, if their mite levels are consistently low, then they might be onto something. And if their mite levels are high, but they swear that it works and it was just a fluke, then maybe look for another technique. Now we got to get this question in here. Yeah, that's what I was going to oh, say. Yeah. Uh, so is VSH queens really going to make a big difference in the in fighting varroa mites? Yeah. So what we're finding now, and I uh, down at the, the Bee Expo in Kentucky in January, I was part of a, a panel where we talked about this. Um, and I do recommend that folks take a look at that because it was a good discussion that we had. The the There has been a long effort to produce a mite-proof bee. And I have yet to meet a mite-proof bee. But I am more optimistic now than I have been in the last five or 10 years about the path that we're on to producing bees that really are genuinely more mite resistant. Mm -hmm. Good VSH breeding programs seem to significantly you know, push us in that direction. Um, UBO, produced by uh, the company Optera, run by um, Kira Wagner, 
that is a uh, that is another selection paradigm. It's another selection tool that that also selects for hygienic behaviors, and that seems like it's going to push us in a in a cool and exciting direction. Yeah. The USDA, not to keep harping on how much I love the USDA, but they are great. Um, the USDA lab at Baton Rouge has been developing the pole line of queens, the P O L line of queens, and that line is, by all accounts, pretty darn varroa resistant. And so we've got these cool genetics that are available to us. We've got more queen breeders who are taking varroa selection more seriously. I'm part of a project right now uh, working with Better Bees Northern Queen stock that we sell every year. Uh, and we've got uh, some grant funded work that we're doing uh, with the University of Vermont and their bee lab. And we're actually working on some different selection protocols, selecting for bees that are grooming, that have high UBO, that have hygienic traits, and, and trying to pile some of those traits onto the same bees. And that seems like it's going to steer us in a pretty fruitful direction. Instead yeah. of just selecting for one super hygienic bee or one, you know, super groomer bee, let's take high levels of both of those and try to breed them together. That seems like it makes for, for a, a more resistant bee. Okay, yeah. Well, here we go. Uh, what about putting some kind of ultraviolet light at the entrance might kill mites without harming bees? Huh. I mean, I've seen, I've seen a lot of proposals, and that's one of them. Um, <laughs> yeah. if, if, if you want to make a prototype and stick it out there, then it, it might very well work. Um, the, the hard thing with Varroa is that they are pretty darn good at hiding themselves. They, they are stick, sticking themselves in a nice, safe, comfortable spot on the bee where the bee has a hard time grooming that mite off. And so you really have to be shining light at a, at a, you know, some strange part of that bee, yeah. even to get, you know, get the mite exposed. Yeah. Um, right. So, and unfortunately, you know, it, this is the challenge of trying to kill, as some people say, a bug on a bug. Yeah. That we've got this, this little arachnid crawling around on this insect and, and something that murders the arachnid that doesn't have any negative effect on the insect is is a harder challenge than you know trying to kill fleas on a dog there's a yeah. lot of things fleas do that dogs don't and you can put a poison on that kills the fleas that doesn't hurt the dogs at all that's more of a challenge for for bees and that's that's similar to like heating up the hive he, uh, uh something in the hive that like mighty might heat treatment yeah yeah and so that's that's an interesting one i don't have a lot of personal experience with it but i Me do neither. I do know a queen breeder who uses this pretty pretty consistently as his only significant mite intervention. He's he's uh, uh, his system is using blowers and and heaters to basically fill the hive with hot air and to sort of cook the mites without without um, hurting the bees uh, significantly. Yeah, all of those different heat based treatments are cool because they take advantage of the fact that mites are more sensitive to high temperatures than bees are. Yeah. But even so, to get the temperature high enough to kill the mites or to weaken or sterilize the mites, there are potentially some non-lethal side effects for the bees that you need yeah. to be prepared for. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, lots of folks have come up with products and said, this is going to heat hives up and, and solve varroa mites. Nobody's ever mailed me one and said, here, David, I want you to test this in your apiary, and then you'll understand how well it works, and then you'll tell everybody to buy one. And I would. If I found something that didn't require chemicals, that was cheap and easy, that killed my varroa mites, I would tell everybody to buy it. And even if I didn't make a penny selling it, you know, uh, but the problem is I've just never met one that that really uh, had proven itself. You know, if you, if you can't show me graphs that prove how the product works, then, you know, I'll be I'll be politely skeptical until I, I see some data. And what about the trophy mites, trophy lay laps? Um, they're yeah. going to come into the U.S.? Well, if they did, then it it would be a mess. And if it they would. don't, then we will count our lucky stars. Um, they they do seem to be expanding their range. The some of the um, conversation about tropilaleps, I think, uh, has a tinge of fear mongering to it because you can get a lot of attention telling beekeepers that something even worse than varroa is coming. <laughs> um, if they do come, where we are currently doing research, my colleagues, not not myself, but but other mite scientists, uh, colleagues of mine, are going to Thailand or Korea and they are doing studies and tests and figuring out what miticides work and what management techniques work and what tools can be used to control them. Um, we do know that they uh, they are incredibly sensitive to the availability of brood. So that whole method we talked about where we create a brood break in our hives by splitting yeah. or by caging the queens, those brood breaks help us with varroa because the varroa really likes to go into the brood and reproduce. Tropolalaps mites cannot feed on adult bees. If there is no brood, they are starving to death. Yeah. 
yeah. very quickly. And so if we can create really nice, strong brew breaks in each of our colonies, if we get into a kind of beekeeping pattern that, that allows that to happen, then trouble elapse will be annoying. They'll change the face of beekeeping, just like Varroa changed the face of beekeeping. But it doesn't mean that, you know, yeah. all of our bees will go extinct and we'll never harvest honey again. You know, David, uh, take it easy now. Don't hate me. <laughs> <laughs> but over the years, I've had really good luck by doing my samples on colonies, when I implement a strategy without using chemicals, mm -hmm. I'll do a green drone comb. Uh, yep. Like you mentioned, I'll use those. I'll cycle those in and out, especially um, all year. I mean, just kind of just mm -hmm. keeping that going. And then I can also implement a, what I, what I do is a brood break during the time that the bees are really building up or the mites are really building up, like say yep. August and July, August, September. Right. And if I can cage my queen for like a week, then it just cuts down on the possibility that, you know, the brood, the mites going to yeah. get into the brood and lay a lot. And doing that, uh, has really seemed to be a method of mine that works really well about 75 to 80% of the time. Now, yep. sometimes I can do all of that and doggone it, that counts and it still doesn't work. Right. right. Yeah. And so <laughs> I bring out some guns, you know, bigger guns, right. you know, for me, crow, let's flash kill them or something. Right. But um, I think that, I think we've kind of summarized this pretty well that there, there's a lot at our disposal now, you know, yep. and you know, when I when I was first beekeeping and mites kind of came into the scene, it was devastating and we just didn't have a lot except, Oh no, yeah. that hive died. But yeah. now we have so many things to be more um, proactive to keep the mite levels down. And for me, David, that's, that's key. I, if I can keep my mite levels down all year long, I, right. I feel and sense that I'm keeping the virus load down. That's exactly it. Your goal has to be yeah. to continuously keep those mite levels relatively low or as low as you can, not let it get sky high and then knock it down all at once. You, you've, that's why we've got to do these multiple interventions. Yeah. Um, that's a really critical part of it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's good. Now, final question, because we're almost out of time, but uh -huh. what about the person that's brand new? We have some new people on the live stream tonight. We're almost mm -hmm. at 700 people, which is outstanding. Thank you everybody for being here tonight. Um, but if, if somebody's brand new and they're like, Oh, I thought this was just going to be a fun little hobby. And now I feel like I'm just under this Varroa attack and I I've got, I'm going to get a package. Should I treat yeah. immediately? And how long do I wait to treat? What do I do? I'm scared to death of these mites destroying my bees. How do, yeah. how do we, how do we calm that person down? First of all, beekeeping always goes better when you've got a mentor. And an online mentor or a bunch of online mentors are helpful. You know, folks you can call, folks you can email, your local university extension beekeeping service, they can help you. But really the best thing is join your local bee club, talk to some beekeepers there. Don't, don't listen to the loudest beekeeper there. Listen to the one who's, who's got the most bees surviving each year. Um, and then figure out what they're doing. Ask if, if they can just, you know, shoot you a text or to give you a, a rough calendar of when they're going to do their treatments and what they're going to use. And then see if you can piggyback on that knowledge until you strike out on your own and, and do your own work. But I think uh, as a Varroa scientist, what I often see in beekeepers is exactly what you described. We want to keep bees because we like bees. They're cooperative. They're all sisters together. They, they produce honey and they, you know, it's delicious and it's so wonderful. And there's this long human tradition of keeping bees. And so we think that bees are, are you know, all about happiness and sunshine and rainbows and cooperation. And then we learn about varroa mites and we go, ooh, yuck. What do I have to buy off the shelf to slap into the hive so I don't have to think about those anymore? Yeah. And unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. All of the, the fun we have learning about bee biology we need to to balance with the, the sort of macabre, miserable creepiness of learning about what these varroa mites are doing, because the better you understand varroa biology, the easier it is to just go in and say, oh, I know what it's trying to do. So I know what intervention is going to stop it. Yeah. Whereas if you if you kind of close your mind off and say, "Ooh, yuck, I don't want to think about them. I just want to kill them. You actually wind up fighting them with your eyes closed. You're, you're always mm -hmm. going to make mistakes because you'll you'll underestimate what the varroa mite is really capable of. and you know, they thrive when they're underestimated. David, you are so wonderful to have on my live stream. Thank you so much. Wow. I, I, I'm just amazed that uh, we can tap into your 
um, wisdom and your experience. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Everybody give a big hand for David tonight. Thank you very much. It's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you guys. And I, I do feel very lucky that I was able to, to go from, you know, my, my research at Cornell to this job at Better Be and to, to serve really as a, a public uh, bee scientist and grow a yeah. scientist. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of folks you can find your local extension, you know, university bee person is really helpful for your state. But if you cross state lines, they'll, you know, they might answer your question, but you're not really part of their job. Yeah. The nice thing about where I am is that everybody's part of my job. Anything that has to do with bees, I'm, I, it's sort of my business to, to help out. And so I, I do my best to do that. And being able to appear on a, a great stream like yours is a really good opportunity for me to help people keep their bees alive, happy and healthy. Yep, absolutely. All right, David, we're going to say good night to you and uh, we'll hopefully have you on in the, in the in the soon future as well. So thanks for being here, David. Absolutely. Good night. Good night. Wow, wasn't that outstanding? We have another giveaway. I know we're right at the top of the hour, so uh, we do want to uh, work in our second giveaway, which is going to be the same thing. It's, we're going to give away today a feeding additive pack that we uh, sell along with the feeder board that you can put on your spring hive again. Uh, help feed if you're not, if you're in a place where you're just not getting the stuff. Use the uh, hashtag PAC. K okay, hashtag pack and we'll uh, give another one away sneak one in here before the eight o'clock hour that's great so hope you enjoyed uh, david sharing with us that was fantastic um we could literally talk for such a long time and the information would just never cease to be amazing <laughs> all right let's see if i can get that okay hashtag p-a-c-k and i'll start sharing that screen wow all right, so I uh, want, to, want to get a feeding pack and uh, feeder board to help feed your bees in the spring. It gives them a good head start if you're in a place like, right now is a good time for me to feed because my bees are trying so hard. And we had a hard, hard frost last night. Oh, it was so sad. I woke up and I saw frost on the grass, on the truck, and we have things, you know, trees are blooming and it's like, oh no. Ah, that's spring in Illinois. So there you go. All right, let's go ahead and draw and uh, see who the winner is today on the feeder board and the additive pack. All right, here we go. We're getting close. Let's all just, oh, Victor. Victor is the winner. There you go, Victor. Congratulations, Victor. Good job. And uh, just email longlanehoneybees at gmail.com, Victor, and they'll make sure that uh, they get that shipped out to you. So thanks for so much. Well, everybody, I want to thank you all so much for being here tonight. And uh, it was incredible. The, uh, the, the, the out showing of um, all the good questions shows me that you guys are sharp, sharp, sharp. So thanks for being a part of, of B team, a big squad. I appreciate it so much. Beak squad is just my audience here that follows me on my YouTube channel. And also uh, here on my live streams, uh, just incredible. I want to give a, a special thanks to all of you. So many donations tonight, which are still coming in. And we do pay our guests, by the way. So uh, that helps a lot. So we always want to pay those that are our guests. And um, so money, it does take money to run a live stream. So I'm not just taking your money and going out and having a milkshake and buying something fun. I'm using it to reinvest in what I can offer you guys in education here on the live stream. So. Uh, Appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for all that you do and donating to this live stream. All right. A special shout out to all of you. I love you very much. I appreciate you. You mean the world to me. And I'm doing everything I can to work hard for you guys on YouTube to give you the good information to help you keep healthier bees, make fewer mistakes. I've got your back. So you can count on me to be there for you. Good night, everybody. See you next time. Mm -hmm.